Okay, well, thank you for coming. It's a great turnout on a beautiful Colorado afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Duan Biggs for his seminar today. And as I think many of you know, this is part of a joint seminar series on human wildlife interactions that's hosted by Human Dimensions and Natural Resources, as well as my department, Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. Uh, a little background on Dr. on Dr. Biggs before he gives his seminar. He was born and raised in Namibia and has interdisciplinary undergraduate training in South Africa. He has an interesting set of majors, economics, development studies, and environmental science. He then completed a research master's at the University of Cape Town in South Africa where he investigated community-based bird watching and tourism. And you'll see a, uh, a research focus on tourism and its impacts uh, in, in what he's done over the course of his career. He earned his PhD at James Cook University uh, in Australia, and again, he worked on tourism, this time associated with coral reefs. He then uh, worked after his PhD for South African National Parks, where he developed a tourism research uh, program for the, counties and, uh, for the country's national parks. After that, he then went back to Australia, where he completed a postdoctoral research fellow with Hugh Possingham at the Center of Excellence for Environmental Decisions at the University of Queensland. And currently, he's a senior research fellow at the Environmental Futures Research Institute at Griffith University. As you'll hear about, Dr. Biggs has been working actively in the international arena with policymakers and with NGOs on the illegal wildlife trade in Africa. And he'll be talking about that in his work today with a seminar entitled, Navigating Polarized Conflicts Over Iconic Wildlife. Uh, thank you for that uh, warm introduction and it's great to be here in uh, Colorado with the blue skies and the mountains, it's stunning. And thank you all for coming uh, to, to participate in our discussion that I, hopefully, I hope will be a rich discussion following this talk. So yes, as you can hear from my accent, and as, as was mentioned, I'm originally, I was born in Namibia, grew up there and in South Africa, and uh, then have moved back and forth between South Africa and uh, Australia, and I'm currently based at Griffith University. I also maintain uh, adjunct appointments at the University of Queensland, where I worked for many years, um, where Hugh Possingham was my supervisor during my postdoc post years, and Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Right, now let's see if I can figure out this. Right, so in my talk today, I'll be um, talking about the, the challenges we face globally today, which we know are, 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 are very, very uh, challenging challenges, very difficult challenges to, to, to deal with. And um, how I see them playing out in the conservation space in which I operate, and what I think we as scientists and thought leaders can do um, to have good science as part of the solution forward. Now, in the, the, the spaces in which I work and the discussions I have with my colleagues, um, there's a lot of negativity around these days. People are saying, how can we possibly do this? The politicians just do not understand. The NGOs do not understand. The people do not understand. And um, that's partly why I use the word thought leaders. And um, we were discussing that over lunch briefly, is that as scientists, it's not only scientists, the sort of the image of someone in a lab doing an experiment, and I've worked out exactly what the truth is and what the right mix of chemicals are to get a certain outcome. It's actually providing thought leadership, thinking more deeply about how we think about society and what we want. So yes, we face a very, very challenging environment right now. If I uh, and um, I'm not sure if some of you feel the same way, but when I wake up sometimes in the morning, I'm like, wow, jeepers, th th these are the types of challenges we face. If I just think back to where my thinking was four or five years ago, I would have thought that impossible, that we today in 2019 are in the situation we are in. So it, it is challenging and it is difficult. Um, we, we face increasing levels of populism, polarization, and resurgent nas nationalism around the world with figures such as these that you'll be familiar with um, emerging as powerful, specifically in wealthy countries. Together with that, we have 
and some uh, political scientists and economists arguing this is the reason why they come to power, increasing inequality. Um, and in the conservation space, and certainly the space in which I operate, there's an increasing disconnect between people like, well, Mark Zuckerberg, and uh, people who live in nice mansions like that, and the people who actually live with where the wildlife is that everyone around the world is concerned about conserving. And that leads to tension and challenges. It's also a very fast-changing global geopolitical environment. So with my work in Africa and also in Latin America, it's very quickly the African landscape is changing from one dominated by um, NGOs and agencies coming out of Europe, the UK, and North America to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And, um, and that means that we're, we're dealing with a, a very fast-changing environment um, geopolitically. And some people have said that, well, in this age of populism, we're engaging in post-truth politics. And that means that um, the debates are being framed largely by appeals to emotion and identity. And they disconnected from objective, inverted commas, facts, and details of policy are of secondary or little importance. So policy making since World War II has largely, in my understanding, been focused more, all right, what do the experts, what can the scientists tell us about this economic or social or engineering problem we, de we have and how can we deal with it? And that's that's, we're moving away from that in, in, into policy making based on, well, what can we get the, the public excited and emotional about? And false facts are reported and used to advance policy positions. And um, we, we, in this room, would be very familiar all with leaders on both sides of the Atlantic that do this a lot, be it for their particular cause in immigration or Brexit or whatever, um, using false facts. But you see it on both sides. Of, of, the de of, of, of these debates. And it also happens in conservation. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that now. And therefore, science and the role of science itself is challenged. So science, um, the informa information deficit hypothesis states, well, we, we want to better conserve the environment. We want to better conserve wildlife. So we need to better understand you know, how a certain action may impact on that outcome that we want to achieve. But now if decision makers and society is saying, well, actually, that's not the basis on which we're making decisions, what does that mean for our role as scientists in the world? And that's, that's a very difficult question we have to ask ourselves. And, and I think, um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a challenging one. But I do think we, we, we still have an important role to play in this world. Um, so I mentioned that, that populism uh, the post-truth policy making, etc., is also emerging in conservation. And because I've worked a lot in the illegal wildlife trade space of late, specifically in Africa around species such as elephants and rhinos, um, this is where my experience comes from. So who in this room have heard much of Botswana and the policy changes in Botswana over the past six months or so? Anyone? Some of you at least. Um, so... Starting late last year, there were reports of um, elephants, 87 elephants, this one in National Geographic, killed by poachers in Africa's last safe haven. Then, a whole bunch of responses, um, and this one was, came from the New York Times because a lot of conservation practitioners and scientists in Botswana were saying, well, hang on, 87 elephants reported by Mike Chase from Elephants Without Boundaries is being poached after a change in policy. Um, but where's the evidence? Show us the elephants that have been poached. We'd like to see them. And then you know, the government of Botswana claims, well, actually, he couldn't show them the elephants that were claimed to be poached. So, and I was in Botswana just a few weeks ago helping run a workshop and talking to the experts on the ground there. There's still not agreement on you know, whether these 87 elephants were poached, were they poached as a result of a policy shift, or were they poached a longer time period ago. Now, if we're dealing within a one country, elephants, how long ago were they poached? Were they poached by poachers? Were the tusks removed in a way that it was likely poachers? Or were they, perhaps, did they die from something else and the park officials took off the tusks as they do? We can't even agree on that. That's, that's a very challenging issue. A very chal well, it's a very challenging space in which we're operating. Now, as, and this is why I'm saying um, 
these issues that we see play out in the House of Commons in the UK and in the, the bodies of government in the United States, they play out in conservation as well. So this is President Masisi, he's the new president of Botswana. And so he took over from um, Karma, who was the previous president, and he instituted a hunting ban in 2014. And there were big problems with the way hunting was being managed in Botswana back in 2013, 2014. Um, and in terms of distribution, who was getting the benefits, etc. So that was banned. And Karma, the previous president, was also very much, he was personally against hunting and he was closely aligned with um, some tourism operators and, and NGOs that were also anti-hunting. But that was felt by the Botswana people to be very, you know, that was a very top-down decision without any consultative process to ban hunting in the country. And so the new president is saying, no, we're going to give the rights of resource management back to the people. Um, and so the elephant, so of what many people in Botswana are saying, this story, story to what extent it's true, the elephants being poached or not, is part of taking on this new president. And so he's now, and there's been a lot on, on the hunting debates in Botswana, calls for boycotts of Botswana as a tourism destination because they want to reintroduce hunting. And so the president has, you know, stood up and says, well, it bamboozles me when people sit in the comfort of where they come from and lecture us about the management of species they do not have. And so in one of his speeches recently, he offered to the United Kingdom, where a lot of the resentment against the hunting ban is coming from and the calls for boycotts, he told them, look, I'll give you 20 elephants, 20 hyenas, and 20 lions. You have them run around the United Kingdom. You're not allowed to manage them. You're not allowed to shoot them. And we'll see how that goes. And we'll come and visit and we'll see them. And so, um, <laughs> and so that's, that to me reflects, that's, you know, that's, well, partly it's the people of Botswana, and there's a lot of support for that sentiment in Botswana. It's the people, they're saying, look, we've been, you know, oppressed into these policies and now we're standing up for ourselves. And it's also partly resurgent nationalism. It's like, we are Botswana, we have the rights over our resources and we're going to manage them in the way that we want to. Now, um, the challenge of, of, I would say, emotional policy making, um, populism in policy making, in my experience and from what I've been exposed to plays out to a larger extent in the space of CITES than anywhere else. The C Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Now that came into force in 1975 due to the widespread concern of the unsustainable use of and trade of wildlife. And it was a rich, back then it was predominantly wealthy Western countries that led in the promulgation. And the thinking was, well, these lower income com countries around the world are harvesting elephants, parrots, etc., and selling them, but they're not doing so in a sustainable way. And we need a convention that everyone agrees on so we can manage that. And it aims to ensure that a species is not threatened by trade. And in its constitution, it states that it's based on science and evidence. And um, I attended the last CITES, um, the, the conference of the parties to the convention in Johannesburg in 2016. There's one coming up next month again. Um, and each country, when they first stand up at CITES, say we're here to make good decisions based on science. Um, and this is, this is what it looks like. So for me, it was an experience of a very, it felt a bit like being in the House of Commons or in Parliament because it's very bureaucratic. You are very, very structured as to who can speak and what you can say. Um, and yes, everyone says they're taking decisions based on science. Um, but in actual fact, in terms of, of watching the workings, of CITES and as government officials actually told me representing countries, if you're talking about small things no one cares about, fish, some plant that no one really actually cares about, it's fine. We, we, we make decisions based on science. If it's something people get excited about, elephants, rhinos, tigers, lions, sharks, no way. It's all about emotion, nothing about science. Um, and so this pans out in a system where there are 183 sign signatory countries. Each present has a vote. Um, and there are two appen appendixes, those of you that are familiar with CITES would know about. Appendix 1 
no trade of wild specimens at all, strict guidelines over captive bred cap any captive bred animals or plants. A, pe uh, a species listed on Appendix 2, monitored trade. That means some trade is allowed, but it, it has to be monitored. Now, what's interesting, and in talking to Simon Stewart and Vivek Manon, Simon Stewart then was uh, chair of the Species Survival Commission, present at that CITES, and Vivek was representing the Indian government delegation. Um, they said, well, actually for, um, and certainly for the Indian government delegation, if a species of interest to them is downlisted, is the framing that's used, it's seen as a loss. So there is an incentive in the political structures and the NGOs pr present as well, there's many present. Also, a species that's downlisted is seen as a loss and a species that, up, that is uplisted is seen as a victory in the, the perception of it and then the narratives around what's going on in CITES, which is, if we stand back and we think about that from a conservation perspective, that, that makes no sense. A species that we can get from Appendix 1 to Appendix 2 is a victory. Yet now the manifestation politically of the way these decisions are taking place, it's the opposite. And around that, there's some very strong lobbying by countries and NGOs. And those of you that are members of NGOs, etc., that are active in the space, have probably already received the booklets and the information about our NGOs taking this and this and this position on, 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 on proposals by countries. And so that would be pro-hunting NGOs would take certain positions, welfare and animal rights NGOs would take different positions. And at CITES, there is... I was, I was um, saddened by how much focus there is on iconic species, like elephants especially. Over, I'd say f CITES covers over 20,000 species around the world. Probably over 50% of the time that the, 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 the conference was ongoing, they were talking about elephants and the trade in ivory, African elephants primarily. They're not even that endangered. There's still 400,000 of them. But this, is, this creates... An, an immense amount of emotion and there's a whole political economy that revolves around the discussions on ivory. And um, certainly the, 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 the grass radical increase in poaching since 2008 has fueled the, um, the, you know, now this is an urgent crisis, our elephants are under threat and we need to do something about this. And all this discussion of elephants is crowding out discussion of, I have a friend uh, and colleague, Jacob Phelps, based in the UK now, works on orchids. Orchids are far more threatened than elephants. Some of them are really restricted. They're highly prized by, by collectors of, 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 of orchids. But there's no time for discussion of that because we're talking about elephants and ivory trade. That's the center of attention. And whenever elephant or trade in rhino horn or perhaps lion products is up on the agenda, the whole forum fills up. The TV comes in, news agencies come in, and it looks like this, a lot of action. And as soon as that discussion's over and they're onto an issue that might be of a much greater conservation concern, but not as iconic or emblematic, half the people leave. And, um, and the policy debates on elephants and rhinos in particular and that was in 2016, and it is most likely to be the same at the one happening next month, is there's two sides. There's the protectionist side, which argue that will ban stronger enforcement, demand reduction campaigns, and destruction of stockpiles is the way to go to solve the poaching problem. And the use and market-based proponents argue, no, what we need is we need regulated markets to manage and sell stockpiles, Th these sales can be used to fund enforcement and conservation through sales of horn, rhino horn and ivory. And yes, of course, we need to take action in the demand markets, but that needs to be demand engagement and also managing, and managing on the supply side to ensure that the products that are produced, the animal products, are done so in line with conservation. And importantly, this trade in wildlife products can fund poverty alleviation and rural development in a way that is conservation-based, that favors conservation land use. And these are how the parties play out. You have back in 2016, and those positions, Kenya has always fervently been on that side, Central and West African countries, the US, India, Israel, and then animal rights and welfare NGOs, typically coming from wealthy countries. And on the other side, we have the Southern African countries, Namibia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Tanzania, Botswana, which is now the new president's changed positions, 
Japan and the pro-hunting groups. And, um, and this just goes back and forth. It's like watching the House of Commons or what I feel like when I you know, watch debates in the US bodies of government. It's just, you, you know, this is nonsensical. We're shouting at each other. We're not having a sensible discussion about what a good policy action is. At the moment, or in 2016, that's the protectionist argument was the one that held sway. It may be different now because situations are changing. But I walked out of CITES and I thought, jeepers, this is just, if this is conservation policy making at an international level, we really are in a very difficult place. Because we're arguing about something and there's what, what really also got to me was that there, so CITES agreed because of all, let me just go back to this slide, because of all the, 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 the domination of the ivory issue at CITES debates, since the first ivory international ban in ivory came into place in 1989, it's really taken over so much of CITES. And the Secretariat thought, well, we need to establish a body to, to collect information that can feed information to parties so that we have an agreed mechanism upon you know, what's actually happening. If we allow a sale of ivory, does it increase poaching or not? That process is called MIKE, Monitoring Illegal Killing of Elephants. Now, Tom Milliken, who runs that, he gave a report, and Mike found in their report in 2016, well, because the volumes of ivory being traded illegally are so high, any sale is relatively small and doesn't, hasn't really had an impact positively or negatively on poaching. But then the, those in favor of, of banning brought in another economist that's not, you know, in scientific terms, very poorly cited, very poor publication record. You know, it's like some of the, in the climate debate, the climate deniers coming in, in, in a discussion on climate and saying, well, we don't like this idea that we're going to take action on climate. Let's bring in a climate denier. He'll stand up to muddy the waters. But CITES has no process to actually then work out, well, what is the balance of scientific evidence that we agree on? There's no process for that. So anyone can just, you know, write a blog and be, we should all you know, hunt pandas from tomorrow because it'd be good for conservation. And if there's a stakeholder group that feels that way and can elevate that voice, that voice will be heard. And so that is very challenging within the CITES process. In addition, I realized in my discussions with people at CITES and watching all this play out, that actually what these people are arguing about are the values that they bring and that they hold around animals like elephants. There's one side that, you know, in, in, in the, as, as Mike, Mike um, has framed it, in, and in our discussions, Mike, you know, that feel, and it's coming from the Southern African perspective, it's okay for, m for, for humanity to dominate animals like elephants and manage them, hunt them, sell their ivory, and use that for conservation. Whereas those coming from a mutualist perspective feel that's really not appropriate. You cannot do that. So there's that fundamental difference, but no one's considering that or talking about that. There's also a real problem with governance within CITES in that the people affected by the decisions, those typically very low income people living in rural parts of Africa, don't actually have any voice in this. So you have all this whole political economy, all the shouting going back and forth, populist rhetoric, emotional rhetoric, but the actual decision affects a peasant in Zimbabwe. But they, they've got no voice in that system. That is, does not align with the principles of good governance as outlined by Lynn Nostrum and, and Mike Cox, who was a postdoc with her that I've had the fortune of working with. It also does not account for local community rights and benefits. And we had a paper coming out um, earlier this year that, that summarizes those principles and why that's important. And very importantly, it leads to a lot of resentment. Um, and so there was a paper by a, a student of mine, uh, Oliver Wright in Oryx two years ago, who he interviewed South African game farmers, landholders with rhinos, and they felt, well, CITES is the enemy because we've got the rhino and we want to benefit from them, but we cannot. So, so that, that, that is not the type of situation we want in conservation. One of the other complexities in this is, is what Phil Tetlock points out, taboo trade-offs. And so Phil, Phil Tetlock's work has showed that if you're uh, uh, any public policy decision, and so he did his experimental work with on, on, on how does the public perceive 
for example, hospital administrators. So if the um, if a hospital if I'm a you know if I present the public with a survey, you've you know what do you think of hospital administrator A or B? A says, well, I have to. There's two patients. There's an you know older patient and a very a younger patient, and I have to let one of them die because there's only one machine to keep them both either alive. So I'm going to have to let one of them die. That's that's sad that you have to do that, but that's okay because it's not. It's not taboo to trade that off. You're trading off one life against another. Um, or if you're trading off, shall we buy aspirin or panado for a hospital? That's kind of a, you know, that's you. which one's better, which one's worse. But Phil Tetlock's work shows that if you then say, well, the hospital administrator says, I had to let that patient die because keeping that patient alive would be too expensive and the hospital's sustainability financially would come into question, the public really does not respond well to that. They find that negative because that's taboo. You're trading off a sacred value of life with a secular value, money and financial sustainability. And in my discussions around and seeing what was happening on these discussions on ivory trade and certainly on hunting, that's part of the discussion as well. Or well, part of the issue and part of the challenge is that there's a, a, a large group of stakeholders that see, well, the whole, the, the notion that elephants could represent money for conservation is is taboo. That's not how you should see it. That's like saying we should allow, allow child prostitution so we can fund childcare. That's just wrong. Because that's, you, you're breaking us, you're, you, you're, you're not upholding the, the sacred value. And we, we see similar challenges elsewhere in conservation. So I have colleagues at ASU, they talk about, you know, and this is happening in Australia as well, Wild horses, you know, this news, news report reads, facing slaughter after U.S. government proposes new regulations. And so it's, so now we're, um, and in Australia, around Canberra, there's a very similar debate. So the government's saying, we need to control the numbers of these feral horses because they're negatively impacting on biodiversity. And the public saying, no, you cannot. This notion that you're killing this wild, sacred animal for some obscure, sort of obtuse abstract concept like biodiversity is not acceptable. And certainly um, the group here, Tara, Mike and, and other researchers here have done a lot of work in the space understanding how these values are shifting and how they affect policy decisions. Next one. So this is a, a very, a very challenging environment as I mentioned that we're dealing with. Um, so what is, what, is, what is the way forward? How do we engage in the space in which it's seemingly policymakers to a fair extent NGOs that have power are not that interested in science or what science has to tell them? Um, in which it's very polarized and there's voices shouting on either side of a particular debate. So what, what is, what is, how do we actually deal with this? How do we engage with this as scientists? So I think we need to try and find a way of establishing a new, a new shared objective that so, um, for example, in the rhino space, it could be, we all agree we need to conserve rhinos and we need to let local people benefit from them. And importantly as well, and certainly in the conservation science circles in which I move, there's a, there's a, a, ret there's, there's a reticence to do this. We need to engage stakeholders with different values and beliefs and different mental models of how the world works to achieve that objective, be it, you know, let's conserve rhinos and let's try and develop benefits for local communities um, from that. And by mental model, I mean the way a person's mind or a group of people's mind constructs a theory of change in their mind about how a particular action is going to lead to a particular outcome. And, um, and there's, there's ample research coming out of the US and elsewhere showing that if I have a value that, for example, hunting is bad, and I see research showing that hunting is good, I'm going to reject that research, no matter which journal it's published in. And the higher my level of education, the more likely I am to reject that research. <laughs> and so if we don't go back and bring values into these discussions, we're not going to move these forward. And very importantly, we need to have an agreed upon way of how this information will be collected in a way that is considered credible by the parties. So the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, managed to do that quite well, as I understand from, um, 
from colleagues of mine that were involved. So it bec they made it very difficult for one any one party to s be after a few years of the assessment and collecting evidence to then say, well, actually, we've got this new information from this inter interesting researcher up in uh, Moscow somewhere, and it says that climate change isn't happening. That wouldn't be, well, you agreed on a process, and now you cannot bring something else in because you don't agree with the outcome. And that we do not have in these debates. And so that's what we captured in this paper on the ivory issue. It came out in science um, towards the end of 2017, wh which we said, look, if we're going to move forward uh, on the ivory issue, which is really dominating societies in a very negative way for conservation outcomes and for policy making, we need an iterative process that recognizes different value systems to get us over this debate or over these, these debates that are really going nowhere. And we developed a, a sketch of well how these taboo trade-offs are playing out in the ivory debate and that if someone who holds a sacred value that individual, uh, that individual elephants are special and selling ivory is mor morally wrong, they're not going to be swayed by any amount of scientific information that sh demonstrates how positive ivory sales are for conservation. And the only way to, to work with that is to actually bring those values into the discussion. And perhaps as um, Tim Dawes' work has shown on fisheries in, the, in, in East Africa, perhaps you could you know, find another solution. Find, well, what is actually the common objective? And so as, as, um, as I've discussed with the Namibian government, uh, you know, what is it? Do you really want to sell ivory or is it actually the, the, the revenue from ivory that you're after? Perhaps, and through having these discussions where you bring values into it, um, you can then be, well, perhaps those that are opposed to selling ivory will never be happy with selling ivory, but they'd be willing to find funds that can compensate countries for the ivory that they cannot sell. And there are some discussions on that, on that um, idea moving forward. And certainly in the ivory debate, as I explained earlier, there are... Um, the, what, 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 what's very clear is that those that hold a pro-trade view would see any paper coming out talking about the bad effects of ivory sales because it enables laundering. They're going to reject it. They'll be, well, that's just I4, the International Fund for Animal Welfare funded that work. We don't believe it. Same on the other side. So we, we need to move beyond this. And so, as I mentioned, this process reconfirmed conservation objectives among the key stakeholders. Importantly, elicit and share the different mental models of the different actions and how they're going to lead to outcomes. So if someone, a stakeholder, holds an uh, uh, anti-trade position, right, so what's the mental model? What are the steps? What's the theory of change in your mind of how we're going to get from banning ivory trade to the outcome, which is conserve elephants and give benefits to local people? A pro-trade person, what, what, what are those steps? What's your theory of change? And then use that process and those iterative discussions to try and find some common ground. Importantly as well, evaluate and synthesize the evidence that exists and identify the gaps. So perhaps there, there are real, con well, there certainly are real concerns in the, in the rhino horn and the ivory debate ar around, well, how are you going to regulate this? What is the risk of laundering? And data can be collected on that. But because we're not having these discussions, we keep the, the conservation community keep shouting back and forth, should we trade rhino horn, should we trade ivory? But no one's going out and actually understanding and doing the work that wouldn't be that hard to do to understand, well, how would these markets actually function if you, if you open them up? And then step four, explore and discuss trade-offs and find some of the more acceptable solutions. And as we point out, this, this process needs to be iterative and you're not going to find a solution in your first round. You need to have multiple meetings with stakeholders over a period of at least a year or two to start moving forward. And um, there was a paper in Nature Climate Change in 2016, I forget the lead author now, that explains that the process that the United States and China followed in the previous administration here in discussions on climate change was something like this. It didn't explicitly refer to mental models, but the key negotiators got together and <coughs> got together over iterations or in multiple iterations over, uh, over longer than a year and they agreed on, okay, what can we accept to move forward? And they took that to, to the Paris, Paris uh, meeting on climate change. So following the paper that came out in science and, and I really wanted to try to take this forward into action. I didn't want the, excuse the pun, 
those ideas just to stick in the ivory tower and not go anywhere. So I had lots of discussions <laughs> with uh, various people, including John Scannon, the, the, the Secretary General of CITES at the time. I said, look, you know, would you, what's the Secretariat's position on putting into practice some of these uh, process like this? Um, I discussed the idea with various people in the IUCN. And in the end, um, I decided, or well, I, I managed to find a way forward. But operationalizing a process like that into action is, is, is difficult. And certainly in, 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 in many of my discussions, because the CITES space on ivory people were, no, that's not going to work. Rhino horn, also not. Lions, no. It's too controversial, it's too polarized. There's no, people do not want to engage in that, in, in a process like that because, and also there's lots of stakeholders in those debates that actually do not have any incentive to find common ground or a solution. They're benefiting from the status quo. Um, and then also some people are really very, have really strongly held values and they'll need to really be put in a position where they feel they have no other option before they can negotiate and right now they feel they're getting what they want so why would they even engage in a process like this? Um, so the CITES space, I concluded, at least for now, is not going to, the process like that's not going to move forward. Not, certainly not in the next few years. Um, also, in my discussions with various people, I was fortunate enough to spend some time with Lynn Scarlett in Tanzania late last year. She's the global policy lead for um, TNC. And she mentioned in a lot of TNC's work, what they find is they can really bring people together, very different stakeholders coming from very different perspectives, if an intervention or an initiative is place-based. Um, and certainly those colleagues of mine who have worked in South Africa in polarized stakeholder environments, such as cap catchment management, they found the same. And, and I think it's because that's, it's grounded. If you're talking about a place, it's grounded. The already you have some common ground, physically that you're talking about around, well, what are we going to do about hunting in the space and conservation? Um, and importantly as well, there needs to be an entry point that is politically feasible. So hunting in the international, certainly in the West right now, isn't politically feasible. The, the, the wave is anti-hunting. Um, and so whatever one does has to, has to, be, has to align with with the prevailing powerful narratives. And those considerations and discussions is what got me to work and focus on initially starting in Namibia, so back to the map of Africa, where I was born, um, working with uh, the Luke Hoffman Institute and also the IUCN and UN Environment, Max Gamera is quite involved, on human-wildlife conflict in Namibia involving iconic species. So this is the last part of my talk before we get to discussion, so I'll just talk a little bit about this. Um, Namibia's got, from independence from South Africa in 1990, they developed a very extensive program of community conservancies. All these little numbers, all these numbers, all those white areas are community, communal land where the communities agree to have it as a conservancy, manage the land for conservation. There have been some, there have been many challenges, but certainly in terms of key wildlife species of interest, there have been a lot of successes. And so elephant numbers have taken off, more than doubled. What this means, and, and those conservancies typically have a concession for a tourism operator to operate in their concession, and they have some sort of profit sharing agreement. agreement. But what the increase in wildlife, so the conservation success means, is that there's a lot more human wildlife conflict. So when I was there, uh, two months ago, went to one of the lodges, this, this elephant in the desert had broken into the lodge to try and get at the food stored there in that shed. Now if you're a lodge and you depend on tourism income, this is great because now the tourists love this, you can take photos, you know, it's exciting and you can buy more food. But if you're a peasant farmer, which really the, 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 the farmers in those conservancies are, this is the end. Because you're not getting the money from the tourists directly, you have to wait for government compensation, which often doesn't come or is delayed. It's very little, and that's your livelihood for the you know, next six months or year. And so there's a lot of tension 
coming out on, well, how should we manage these conflicts? And uh, with the colonial history in Namibia, that's part of it. But importantly, in Namibia as well, there is, Namibia is the most unequal country in the world now in terms of Gini coefficient. And there's a growing group of stakeholders in the capital city, Vintuk, and one of the coastal towns, Sokopmund, that are, that are, have strongly feel that, well, any shooting of elephant is wrong, even for in the case of human wildlife conflict. Rather get the people to move, plant chilies, do something else. We cannot have government mandated sh shooting of elephants in the case of human wildlife conflict. Now, in, the, on, in opposition, there's some community groups that have formed that have said, we want no more elephants. Get the elephants out of our conservancies. And there's some conservancies that are saying, well, we're just going to pull out of the program because we have to deal with this and there's no mechanism for us to you know, really benefit and the costs are outweighing the benefits. So that is a space that when I discussed what we framed around ivory and that process for bringing these stakeholders together, that the Namibian NGOs active and the government there and also the Luke Kaufman Institute felt, well, that's, that's a space that we can try and experiment with, with this process and see if we can move forward and perhaps expand it from there. And so I was in Namibia in February, had a number of workshops at national level and at community level. And the plan is to actually work through this process with a focus on, on elephants. And so we'll do some surveys, run through some, some of these workshops and try and see if, well, this helps that those stakeholders get over this polarization that, they, that they're in. So just to wrap up, um, I've covered a lot of territory in this talk. Um, myself and my collaborators and students, there's some related research underway that I think links with what people here are doing. Um, Hubert Chuang on the left in that picture is working on value orientation. He's from Hong Kong, so he's Cantonese. He's working in China on um, perceptions of, of rhino horn trade legalization. And with the, the, the government of China's statement last year that they want to move towards legalization, that's particularly relevant. And so he's doing a choice experiment on that. Abigail Brown on the right is doing uh, larger scale online surveys around, well, how do people in different parts of the world feel about potential rhino horn legalization? What are their choice preferences? As well as looking at choice preferences in the management of human wildlife conflict. Um, the other work that I'm doing in a different space, but uh, the, 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 to me, a lot of similar issues come out. Um, I was leading a project together also with the Luke Hoffman Institute on sustainable supply chain for soy and reducing biodiversity threats in global commodity chains and focused on soy and in the Brazilian Cerrado. And Angela Guerrero pictured here was the postdoc appointed to, to, to actually do the surveys and the work on the different stakeholders' mental models. And there is, so it's less, it's less emotive than the elephant issue because it's soy and it's deforestation, but some of the same tensions emerge. So in some of the meetings that I was there, the Brazilian, um, so for example, we were at a workshop with, uh, with a big Brazilian farmer. Uh, and he was very pro-conservation and it was, um, the workshop was being largely held in Portuguese, but fortunately I speak Spanish so I could follow most of it and I spoke to the farmer and the farmer was like, oh, you're a bird watcher, I have these birds on my farm, we have Maine wolf, we have giant anteater, I'll, you know, come and stay, I'll come and show you. Very, very clearly, clearly positive about conservation and wildlife. So one of the, um, one of the policy measures some, some of the NGOs are putting forward to manage the risk of deforestation in Brazil is a moratorium on land clearing, which is largely being cleared for soy. And when that was mentioned to this farmer, that was clearly very pro-conservation and had installed camera traps to monitor the main wolves on his property, he said, no, it's my right. I'm a farmer. It's my right to clear my land. If you're going to do that, then I'm going to clear it because it, you cannot step on my right to clear my land. I'm not going to clear it. But if you tell me I can't, I will. So, um, so that's sort of an identity issue, and certainly with Brazil's current president, Jair Bolsonaro, that sort of that tension, which is sort of it's a global commodity, the, these forests that we want to conserve, yet it's the local right to clear it, and and the sort of the values of injustice and the values that people hel hold around. Well, what what, I what is my right to clear my land, um, and 
why should I listen to the EU if they don't want me to clear it, etc. And there, there's certainly some, some similar tensions there and that we have a PhD starting in that space soon as well. Um, and that's that, that, that will be looking at uh, TRACE, the um, initiative started by Toby Gardner out of the Stockholm Environment Institute where they're providing much finer scale information on, on supply chains and it, the impact of buying, a, say, soy from a particular district in Brazil. Are you contributing to deforestation, more or less? And to what extent that actually helps change people's mental models along the supply chain to, towards um, greater sustainability and, and, and reduced biodiversity impact. So finally, to conclude positively, in our very challenging post-truth era of populism and identity politics, understanding different values and perceptions of stakeholders is critical. We have to kind of almost go back from a lot of what of conservation science has been doing for the past few decades and be, look, we need to understand these values and bring them into the debate. Otherwise, we're not going to move forward. Um, and we need processes to contribute these to policy and decision making and that incorporates diverse cultural values and identities. And that's particularly important um, because the geopolitical environment's changing. So I work in tourism as well, as was mentioned earlier, and I was involved in some discussions around uh, wildlife parks and catering for Chinese tourists. They have a very different perception around, well, is it appropriate to be close to animals? And I, you know, I want my photo together with the animal, which certainly the way I grew up in South Africa, that's not what you do. You look at the animal, it's there, and you let it be. But so these are different perceptions, different value systems around how humans interact with nature. We need to be able to have mechanisms to deal with those. And importantly, as a last point, we need to, and this clearly, this is an underlying issue that comes out in a lot of these discussions, either rural urban tension, which I know manifests here in the United States, and also certainly north, south, or lower income and higher income country tension, tackle the growing challenge of inequity and perceived injustice, which just exacerbates the polarization. That's it, I look forward to, we have still have, I went over time a little bit, my apologies, but we still have some time for questions and discussion, and I look forward to discussions with many of you in the coming days. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, so feel free. Yes. Um, I appreciate you. Um, you took me back to Namibia. I was in the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Scientific Authority when the Safari Club uh, request for permits to mm -hmm. shoot a finite number of cheetahs and bring them back as trophy came to our office. And they have really good data to show that, in fact, these cheetahs are getting shot by the local herders mm -hmm. anyway. And they can even identify the depredating cheetahs. And these were the cheetahs that they wanted to shoot. And they were willing to say, these are the ones. And of course, that went to such sites and other pieces that were 20 years ago. Yeah. So I can see where, the, where you could pay people for the value of ivory rather mm -hmm. than the ivory. But the people who wanted to shoot these cheetahs wanted to bring back the cheetahs that have them yep. sitting on their wall. Um, how do we make that case that, in fact, we have an obligation that one of the things they were doing was, would be, in the long run, making for wilder cheetahs because they would be shooting at least some of the depredating ones and mm -hmm. hopefully not the ones that were still living on life. Right, so that's a complex question. <laughs> And what, what's actually interesting, and this I think is part of, of the challenge we're dealing with. So in Namibia, there is huge furor around human wildlife conflict and action by the Namibian Ministry of the Environment and Tourism against, say, elephants that are destroying the crops and in often killing people that live in those communal conservation areas. Now, Namibia has a very large commercial um, farming operation as well and lots of those farms and this happened in the just after well in the period I was growing up there so if you look at Namibia so all the whole area that's anything that's not a communal conservancy is commercial farmland and so that would be similar to here in the United States under the previous under the South African regime that was usually or and it's still largely as land controlled by white people and so but a lot of them have switched to game farming as well 
Um, but there, and they're actually killing wildlife to a much larger extent, including cheetahs, than in the communal areas. Yet, for some interesting reason, that does not, that is not a, a, a big political issue, or at least not yet. Um, and so that, that was a fascinating dynamic that came out. Um, and with respect to the cheetah issue, I mean, I can, I can, I would say, well, and again, a place-based intervention perhaps around those commercial farm areas in Namibia is the best way forward because that is really complex because I can see any move towards legalizing the hunting of cheetah in Namibia, highly threatened, threatened animal species and bringing trophies back to the United States is going to be politically very toxic to any government. And so yeah, even though from a conservation perspective it's good practice and makes logical sense. So it needs, it needs a process of the type I've outlined here and that needs to be a long-term process because, because the, the tensions involved and the complexity involved I think are, are immense. And if one can somehow do it in a way that bypasses societies, <laughs> that would be potentially easier, but yeah, that's very challenging. Regarding some of the seemingly intractable in, in issues like hunting and culling mm -hmm. um, in, for example, a landscape like Kaza, where uh, ostensibly elephants are, are increasing in numbers and, and relatively well protected compared to some other areas, um, do you think that with, with those issues being very, very challenging, um, do you think that Potentially, you brought up the point that the communities that are experiencing very high levels of, of crop rating, mm -hmm. do you think that the, the threat, potential threat to conservation that degazetting community conservancies might have, do you think that might be a, a way to marshal some support, financial support specifically from conservation organizations to direct them specifically towards offsetting some of the cost of crop predation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I can see that, the, you know, in, in lots of these landscapes, uh, protection, um, anti-poaching efforts were seen as the most important and lots of conservation resources were directed toward anti-poaching efforts. Um, mm -hmm. If elephants are somewhat well protected, do you think some conservation resources might be put toward offsetting the costs of crop rating in some of these areas? If degazetting these conservancies could be seen as costly for conservation. I think Do, I does think that make sense? So I'm trying to I'm trying to see how we can get community sort of linked to global conservation and up toward the level of societies. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a good point. And obviously, you work in that region, so Kaza, I forget Kavongo and Zim, Zambezi conservation area is a very large conservation initiative that's connecting southeastern Angola, Namibia, northern Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So it's in that region. Um, and so certainly part of a lot of the discussions in Botswana are taking place in the space of Kaza. And I think that's a, that's a very, um, that's, that's a motion that some, you know, some conservancies are saying, look, well, if we're playing this uh, game of ruthless politics, you won't give us what we want. We're going to not give you what you want. Now, I think, yes, that could work, but that becomes quite, that's a, quite an antagonistic move. You're saying, well, I'm going to, and there's some South Africans who feel this way as well. We're just going to, we, we're, and um, there was a Zimbabwean uh, prior conservancy manager I was talking to last year or the year before, and he said, they've got too many lions. The lions are causing so many problems with the communities. They've put out a call for conservation groups anywhere from, any, from anywhere in the world to help them move the lions elsewhere. No one could come up with the money to do that. So they said, we're just going to kill them all you know, as a, as a move to try to get money to conserve them. Now, I think if we, if we in a political space where we get to that point, that's, that's undesirable. It could work, but it's undesirable. It would, be, it would be better if we were to be able to generate the narrative and the framing, well, these are our lions. Well, these are, this is a global public good, lions or elephants. Yet there are some costs born locally with these animals present, and those people are particularly, happen to be of, of it will fall into a very low income part of global society. We need to establish mechanisms to achieve our shared global purpose for our shared global good. I think that would be uh, 
my preferable framing, but certainly what you're suggesting and the threat is, 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 is could work. And I think that's what some people are saying with what Masis is saying in Botswana. One can see how some of these statements, which, where are they? The one there where it bamboozles me. Um, I can't find that slide now. There, this one. Um, this could, if you then, if the narrative goes along the same trajectory, and some people have actually, in private conversations, told this, said this to me in Namibia and Botswana, is that conservation is for the white people. You know, and we're still doing it because you guys have power and money. And once you don't, we're not going to do it anymore. And, and I think, and that's, that's a very undesirable situation. And so, um, and one can see this trajectory being starting with these people from the UK telling us how to manage our elephants to being, well, who, who, who do we have these elephants for anyway? We don't want them. We want cattle. Um, so I think we, we that, that, that could emerge, but I think we'd want to avoid going that far down that road if we can. Unfortunately, politics in the United Kingdom here and in Australia is already there. So um, maybe it's unavoidable. Yes? So um, I'm curious what you think of the uh, view that um, it's not really fair to uh, talk about um, you know, the legalization of ivory and wine or in the same breath. That, you know, it's, it's an apples and oranges issue. Um, but it's maybe, I, I am um, kind of swayed by the argument that, um, especially with the overpopulation, overpopulation issues of elephants in southern Africa, like around Chobe, you know, they're not in all the forests, um, that there will be to be kind of, you might as well try to profit off of that. Um, but the rhinos will have far lower numbers, you know, they wouldn't be able to afford the time that, that it would take to set up a legal trade. And then plus if you do that, you're legitimizing a snake oil and fur, um, as well as the fact that in Vietnam, which is the current hot spot for the current uh, biggest market, it, it's not really a traditional use, it's only taken off in the last Ten years or so, that um, is a cure for cancer, um, and therefore, um, you know, it's, it, it, it would be logical to set up a limited legal trade for ivory, but the rhinos don't have that luxury. What do you think about that? Right? Well, I think that's. Uh, I've actually worked a lot more in the rhino space than in the <laughs> ivory space, and so I have a lot of. Um, I have separate papers and presentations I can give on that. I think yes, the rhino and the elephant space is different. Um, I think so, but in, in what so, and one of the key differences that, that many people I think don't realize is rhino is a renewable resource. It's like fingernail. You can get up to 13 horns from a rhino during its lifetime. And you don't have to kill it to get the horn. And we've actually got a paper coming out hopefully soon in biological conservation that I did with some animal welfare scientists looking at, well, what is the welfare impact? If you're concerned about welfare of individual animal of a, getting rhinos, a rhino horn from a poached animal versus a sedated animal, which would have to be a legal market. So that, that's coming out. So that's one difference. Then, um, yes, numbers, that's another difference. Distribution is another difference. Rhinos, well, white rhinos are only rarely in South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, to some extent Kenya, where they've been brought back from Southern Africa. Elephants have a broader distribution. Um, but in my mind, and having participated in these discussions, the central challenge in both debates is the differences in values. So as you mentioned some things, Vietnam's now the biggest market, it's cancer, it would, legalization would destigmatize. Those are, those are arguments, they're, val they're, they're important considerations and they, they need to be assessed, but no one's actually, I hear researchers in the rhino horn space saying, no, no, that's wrong. There's still main market, still China. And no, legalization won't destigmatize. Look at other products that would, you know, made legal. And those are things we, we can research, but no one's out there doing the, in the research. And so, and so, and, and one of the central challenges is that we're not actually talking about what we're really fighting about, which is values, which is the South Africans are saying, well, it's my right to have access to or the ability to sell these horns and it's fine to do so. And it makes sense because there's a long history of market-based conservation success there. Other stakeholders actually, and are not comfortable with that. It's like, and I've had in papers on that issue online, the response would be, so do on you want to legalize the sale, sale of rhino horn to fund rhino conservation? So now are you going to propose the legalization of child prostitution to fund childcare? 
That's how people see it. And so you, we need to have those discussions and then identify, okay, well, what are the real knowledge gaps of which you've pointed to some that we can then collect information on and to understand, well, is this a good idea or not? And one of the real challenges, and we had a short piece out, I think it was either science or nature and then covered in the conversation as well on the Chinese move for legalization. So the China said they want to legalize. All the big NGOs said, terrible idea, you can't do it, don't do it. Bad, bad China, don't do it. Then the South Africans and Namibians are saying, well, it's our rhino, the Chinese want it, we're just going to sell it to them. Stuff the West, stuff these people who are telling us that we can't do it. And I think that's really, if they go ahead with that, that's really dangerous. Because with, you know, you want, if you're going to have a legal trade in rhino horn, you need strong international oversight. You need to make sure it's managed well. You need the international community looking in, saying, the NGO saying, look, is the money going to community development? Is it going back to conservation? Are the rhinos being well managed? And the current polarized narrative means we're kind of headed in the opposite direction, whereas those with the rhino are just going to be like, the Chinese want them, we're going to sell to them. Because we cannot come together and agree on, well, how are we going to manage our differences in our values towards these animals? Okay, why don't we hold questions and we can transition to this wonderful smelling food. Uh, and so you'll be around for the next hour or so, and 